It is such a pleasure um, to be speaking with Brian LaBelle about performance and politics and public health for this issue of interventions. Um, for those watching, Brian is a performer, a teacher and a curator who's interested in creating work about bodies and how they are watched, policed, poked, prodded and loved by others. His work has been shown internationally in a range of contexts from Harvard Medical School to Sydney Opera House to the National Theatre in London and Lagos that was published by Red Globe Press. Um, so thanks so much, Brian. Um, can I maybe just start with a really open question? So as you know, this um, issue of interventions looks at public health. What how do you feel about that term? Do you engage with it? Do you offer critical responses to it in your work? I try not to get bent out of shape recently about semantics. Um, in, in, in the way that like, I believe that people that genuinely work in public health give a crap or a shit or whatever, give a fuck. They give all crap, shit, fuck. Can they give all those things um, about, um, about, society and how people can live healthier lives and be dignified in their illnesses, disabilities and access needs. I really like genuinely believe that. I don't think that anyone goes into the umbrella term of public health, whatever kind of corner of that word that you use in order to rob people, to make people homeless, et cetera. I th so, so because I still believe that everyone that sits under that umbrella, be it the right term or the wrong term, uh, have mostly their hearts in a good way with very rare but important to call out exceptions. I'm kind of fine with it. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's just a just a kind of starting point really to get talking about some of the, the themes of the issue. Um, I guess from my perspective, I'm coming from, um, well, I work with migrant domestic workers who are working in private houses. So the idea of the public is really helpful in thinking about workers' rights, insurance, um, and those things that usually come under the kind of the remit of systemic and societal concerns that are often not really applied to domestic workers. Um, wrongly, I think. I think they should be able to avail of those things and be protected by them. So I guess that's kind of where I come to the term from. And I know that in your work, you kind of, um, I'm thinking about Binge, for example, um, a recent performance where you're focusing on very, very kind of intimate and across your work, I think, very intimate experiences of health. Um, and yet always kind of situating that within a political sphere. Would that be a fair judgment? Yeah, I would say that my work is has always been kind of small p political as opposed to kind of big p political. Um, but I think that's because I've always been drawn to individual narratives. And so for me, the political efficacy of, of the work that I do is, is really in, in platforming unheard voices. Um, you know, that that started really from my work as a young adult with cancer, which of course, um, I, I entered that conversation with a little, with, with quite a bit of privilege, white, male, et cetera. But like, actually it was about uh, a marginal, it is a marginalized story, a young person with cancer. It's a perspective we, we don't often hear. It was a queer story, et cetera. So um, there was something, am I, did I just trail off in a totally horrible way? No, I think you were about <laughs> to say there was something about, and I was interested in the way you were going to go with that. Um, so that is how I see you know, the, the, the politics of my work are about really platforming as many voices as I can and to like demonstrate a world that's filled with a lot of voices. So because of that, that initial starting point with my cancer work really revolved around my own cancer story. But as I grew, I realized the, the inefficiency or the, no, the ineffectualness of only telling one young adult with cancer uh, story was, and that I needed to like grow and learn other people. So I've had a lot, you know, so it's been kind of my life work or specifically around illness to find hidden stories, to find the marginalized stories that then we can link those to larger conversations about racism, classism, privilege, et cetera. Mm. 
And that's what I've been trying to do for the last 15 years. Can you tell me a bit about what that politics is in the sense that why do some voices get marginalized and why are other narratives about young people with cancer, um, you know, why are we seeing some things every day or very close up and why, why do others become marginalized? What's at stake there? There is the great, the great fallacy about cancer is that it, people think that cancer is so overwhelming and big that, and it's so hard and it's so emotional, which of course it is, um, but that, that supersedes any racism, classism or mm-hmm. oppression, but actually, and, and they say, oh no, like we don't see, you like, I can genuinely hear people in the worlds of cancer saying, we don't see race here. We don't see race here. We just see people with cancer because we all care about people with cancer. But the reality is that we care more about certain bodies with cancer than we do about others. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we, you know, we see the environmental damage that affects communities of color more that causes cancer, et cetera. We see um, uh, kind of communities in need not providing you know, confidence in, in approaching health or in healthcare coverage itself. And you see communities that get sicker faster, et cetera. So we see huge disparities along the way. I just lost my train of thought again, I'm sorry. Um, but what was your question again? It was about why some narratives get marginalized and why others become, I would say maybe even hyper-visible. Yeah, so I mean, Susan Sontag noticed this from the very beginning that, you know, that cancer is, is related to whiteness, to middle classness, to, to something that is held inside of you, this, the great British quiet that then you hold a problem in so much, it just explodes into cancer. And that was, of course, the, the images that we lived with for, for decades, if not centuries. Um, but I think also, I mean, one of the stories that I've always been fascinated from cancer history was the story of uh, the Jimmy Fund, which is the first really public cancer fundraiser. And in the book, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies uh, by Siddhartha Mukherjee, um, it really cleanly identifies that the team behind the Jimmy Fund, which was at the Boston Hospital, Boston uh, clump of hospitals, they were like, we need to fundraise with cancer. What should we do? We got to get a kid. Everyone will love a kid. So we'll slap a kid's face on it. Ah, the kid's name from the Jimmy Fund is Einar Gustafsson. The kid that they featured was Einar Gustafsson. But of course, that name sounded way too foreign for America mm-hmm. at that time. And so they called it Jimmy. And Jimmy, the, the radio broadcast is magnificent, actually. It's really amazing because it, it charts uh, you know, a, a famous radio host talking to a kid about what he would do if he was out of the hospital. And he would say, I play baseball. And he said, what's your favorite team? And then the team shows up in the room and you can hear the kids screaming. And then they sing, take me out to the ball game together. Which if, if you know American songs, it's, it's as close as we get to kind of a secular national anthem, a song that everyone knows. So, so what I take from this story is when you listen to that Jimmy Fund audio, and you can hear it's still on their uh, website. It is so moving. It is like genuinely moving, but it also puts in place all of these isms about, of course, the face of an innocent child is more effective as a cut fundraising tool than a smoker, than, yeah. um, than uh, you know, you know, then, then someone that society might judge, a marginalized person, et cetera. Uh, the name isn't white enough. It's not hegemonic enough. And then I see, I think we see a, a huge, a huge heritage of fundraising of the world of cancer coming out of that Susan J. Komen, Susan G. Komen Foundation for Breast Cancer is a huge one in America. The Lance Armstrong Foundation just seeped in questions of masculinity and whiteness and privilege. All of these things that go a little bit unnoted, but I think if you see them, they instantly become clear. Barbara Ehrenreich uh, in her book, Smile or Die, it really charts that, which is really that like the image of cancer is this and that. And I think the reason why 
things are marginalized, just to come back to that point, why yeah. are some people so, because I think they realize that the most mainstream story will raise the most money. I think that's where it came from. And I think that's where it's going, which is the reason why my fight has always been kind of against cancer charities. So like in the UK, we're, the disabled community politically has really moved beyond the charity model of funding for their health and well-being. They're saying these are access, these are you know access money that we need to live with dignity. But with people with cancer are very comfortable fundraising for their own quality of life and dignity. So that we are comfortable with Cancer Research UK. We're comfortable with Mil Macmillan being one of the major um, you know, providers of cancer care. But that's just a charity. And you know, the fight against NHS privatization mm. is also in some ways the fight against charities. You know, like those things have to go kind of together, but people don't like hearing I hate cancer charities. It's not politically correct to say, but what happens with charities that then they can prioritize the programs that they're doing based on how much money they can raise. So for me, it's an kind of an economic um, exercise in why some voices are heightened and some voices are back. And also there's been, you know, just if we can go back to the story of Henrietta Lacks in America, there's huge story and the Tuskegee Airmen and, you know, black Americans having just hugely horrific experiences of being abused, stolen from, trialed on in a way that's like not dissimilar to Mengele in the Holocaust, right? Like, and, and actually what happens when you totally abuse a community is that they don't feel part of the story. So they, the stories don't come out as much. So I, I think the not of why there are not more stories from the margins of cancer care. I think it, the, the, the reasons are very complex, but that's, that's a very long answer to your question, sorry. It's a very, sorry. it's a super interesting answer. And um, I guess as somebody coming from critique of humanitarian and kind of ethnographic portrayals of the so-called margins or people who become marginalized by certain humanitarian um, kind of ways of funding or paradigms um, of um, narrating humanitarian action, that really speaks to a lot of what I've been reading or encountering elsewhere as well, that, that there is this similar kind of charity model, um, which sets the tone in a completely, and sets the agenda in a completely kind of unaccountable way. Who are charities accountable to? Of course, I mean, that, and that, the thing that's really so sad about it is that also the transition between where we are right now to a justice-led model that is, that transition is going to be long. It's going to be a generation. It's going to be 10, 20 years before the, I mean, the, the nonprofit industrial complex, the humanitarian aid industrial complex, these things are deeply rooted deeply rooted and they're not just going to flip on a dime you can't just shut down cancer charities because people will die so mm. I, I think what's also frustrating is that like the the long-term visioning of this work really requires a real patience uh, for it but I have to tell you one example from I do a lot of talks with young people with cancer I do a lot of work with teenage cancer trust and I would always do, and maybe you know this, if you ever sat in on a sex ed class when you were young, it starts with like, people put a piece of paper anonymously, a question anonymously, they fold it up and they pass it so that, you know, we answer all these questions. And I would always do that exercise with young people with cancer, not about sex, but it could be about anything. And a question that always came up. And, you know, you would ask, as soon as you hear the question, you go, who here has asked themselves this question? Or who thinks that this is, a question always came up and it, it hurts me to say it, but, I, but it's true and I'm on multiple occasions. How much money do I have to raise? Now, for me, there's like not a more shocking and upsetting question from a 14 year old with cancer that they understand the way this works so well that they get that their lives are dependent on charity. 
And of course, Teenage Cancer Trust was in a position in which Stephen, uh, Stephen, um, oh my God, what was his name? Stephen Sutton, excuse me. Um, Stephen Sutton, who was a very famous young person with cancer, raised millions and millions and millions of dollars, much like this guy, you know, this old man walking around his house during lockdown, raising money for the NHS. And, and as soon as you see that, you young people are, are embedding this question of like, my life is built on the niceness of other people as opposed to justice. And of course, this is also a lot of, you know, and that's, that's, and young people with cancer are not even a marginalized group of people. But, you know, as soon as you start looking at marginalized populations, that, that concern goes up and up and up, I think. So I always found that really devastating. And the reason why I wanted to like, always take my time to call out the charity model, but it's complicated and it will take a very, very long time to transition. Mm. Because genuinely, the vast majority of the people that work in these spaces are not bad people. They're not, you know, they're not evil. They're not, they, they might be a little do-goody, but that's not, that's not violence in, in, in the same way that it could be. And, and, and that's a hard group to want to push along or to challenge nice cancer nurses, nice uh, fundraisers for cancer places. You can't spit at a person with a bucket, <laughs> but actually that bucket's part of the problem, but you can't, it's hard. Mm. It's hard mm. to critique. Yeah, I guess it, yeah, it comes back to the tension between structural and, um, and intimate, I suppose, or structural and um, individualized. Um, that, is, that is at stake in so much social justice work, I guess. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I think what you're saying, I, I don't know. I mean, part of me wants to say that what you're saying um, feels especially urgent now, at least in the UK context, because of the way that um, the NHS has been on the one hand kind of recuperated as this national symbol of Britishness or um, a kind of national framework that excludes um, undocumented migrants, for example, who've been extremely um, hard hit by Corona um, and not eligible for, or not kind of taking up um, healthcare because of the hostile environment policy and so on. Um, and on the other hand, the kind of privatization of the NHS, which has been looming for so long. Um, and, and, and just, so that's, that's critical. And I'll just say really quickly from my, like the cancer perspective, in addition to that, is you live by charity, you die by charity. And actually what happens with cancer is that right now cancer charities are struggling for money. And the reason why is because other people are giving money to other places. But for years, cancer has been dependent on that charity. So now people have unexpected things that they're trying to fill the holes in, or there's a huge economic depression and they don't have that money. So if you're dependent on it, it's great. I mean, I remember when the tsunami happened in 2004, 2005, I remember, I remember because it was on Christmas day. And the reason why, I mean, everything that came out of that was so horrific, but one of the long-term effects that, that people only noticed a month or two later was that that's the week that a lot of Americans give charity yeah. because it's about the tax cycle. And everyone, everyone, everyone gave a thousand dollars to the Red Cross who were doing work, you know, really immediately they had to. And then they didn't give their money to charity, to cancer charities. And then six months later, cancer charities were like, fuck. We're, wow. we're. So these are like, people do make choices that are emotional about the money that they give. You know, so, and actually when something disturbs it, you can't build a budget on it. You can't build a life on it. And certain things are easier to fundraise for than others. It's, it's, it's tragic that there's not been more research work on lung cancer. It's, it's tragic that there hasn't been more research work on cervical cancer. Those are related to judgment that people have about those things. It's the same as HIV and AIDS. It's the same as Ebola, you know, existing somewhere that's not here, et cetera. So I think, 
the NHS is so precarious now. Mm. It's so precarious. I mean, the other thing is I, if, you know, my, like my other big scare is that Boris Johnson, they might be able to get out 30 million vaccines in the next two months. And if they do, I think we'll see a conservative government for the rest of our lives. Because I think that they'll spin it in a way that is successful for them. And they'll say, we did that so fast. And it's horrific. They won't, they won't even think about highest death rate in Europe. You know, like they won't, it, it will totally pass them by. Because people are emotional about the way that they think about these things. So, and of course, every crunch that happens to, to, you know, to, to white people in the country, you know, the more anyone who is not a middle-class white person is going to suffer exponentially horribly. Mm. And that's just, mm. but that's the way everything's been. I mean, COVID didn't change anything about our relationship to healthcare. It just totally exaggerated what was already existing. Yeah, I think that's, and when I asked the question and said, mm, part of me wants to ask this, the other part of me was thinking the whole point of this issue is in, of interventions is that we don't have, we don't have a piece on COVID. Like we don't have, we're not seeking to kind of respond to what's going on um, by saying, oh my God, look, public health suddenly exists. It's suddenly a concern. No, the whole point of this issue is to kind of look before COVID, to look after it, to think about this historically. And I think one of the things that um, has come up, um, yeah, and it's so many, so much of what I've been reading or experiencing or hearing from people is that, yes, COVID kind of exaggerated inequalities that were already there. And it made people who don't have disabilities or don't have disabilities yet, or don't have disabilities at the moment, or don't have, um, aren't, you know, aren't living with um, long-term house conditions, for example, suddenly aware that um, staying at home all the time is a thing, or that worrying for your health every day is a thing, or yeah. that, yeah. Um, they will forget these lessons. They will forget these mm. lessons very quickly. The power of normality is very strong. The power of capitalism is very strong. The power of, of ableism is mm. very strong. And I, the moment that people can leave the house, they, they might have more of an awareness, but they will also be thankful that they never have to think about it again, mm. or that they think they never have to think about it again. And that is, I don't think we're going to see a huge change in how disabled people are treated in the country. I, I just don't think we will. I think, I think some more non-disabled people will get to work from their home. I think there might be some changes to schooling, to transport, but I think people will forget them very quickly. You can already feel people forgetting and they're still in it. There's just not been the outrage. There hasn't been the outrage, mm. which is, is so depressing. Are you speaking mainly of a UK context or are you talking more globally? I'm speaking of the UK context, sorry. Um, but I think globally, I think people will, maybe these questions of mutual aid will have uh, spiced up people's life enough that they might continue caring or knowing their neighbors, et cetera. But I think, I, I think that the way we were is strong. And, I, and that includes ableism. Mm. That includes a real selfishness. Cause I think what you'll also see now is people are like, I can't believe I wasted a year of my life on COVID. Now, no one's gonna tell me I have to put a ramp in this event. I'm just living my life. I'm living full, I'm, I'm doing it. Or when there's an economic problem, they'll go, oh my God, this question about access or health uh, accessibility to everyone else is really expensive. So they're gonna make an economic argument for ableism or for not extending healthcare to all people in a dignified way. And they'll use the economic con conversation and 
the kind of xenophobic nationalists will run with that. And that's, and that's, and that's just the soil that's been seeded now. Do I sound mm. too dire? I mean, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a counter argument at the moment. My question I suppose would be, um, you know, as somebody who spent so many years working against those kind of narratives, what you know what do we what do we do now like how do we how do we counter that I think you counter I you know to be honest I think you counter with unapologeticness I think the most powerful I think I mean I think it's direct action and I think it's I think it I you know I think it is screaming at Twitter about Sia's movie i think you know about it not casting uh any disabled um actors in a story about it. i i think it's like about shaming and telling and saying like look we it's exhausting to have to keep reminding you about how inequalities ac across disability race class gender etc we have to keep reminding you that you have to include this, you have to include it, you have to include it. It's not political correctness, it's not any of that shit. It's that like people have stayed off of people's radars for a very, very long time. We've got some visibility of it right now. We need to like keep on people about what they need to be remembering. Mm. So I'm you know, that I think is it's a humorless, boring job to always remind people that other people exist. But that's, that's part of the boringness of life. And that's why people have to have great allies and you know, think about strategies for self-care because that work is exhausting and yeah. very unfulfilling. It's so boring, these conversations we're having. It's so boring. It's like the conversations about disability access are boring, not because they're not essential, but because how, how is anyone arguing against this? And how dehumanizing is that? And if we could be just sorting out dignity, quality of life for people, et cetera, we could be doing so many more interesting things in art, in politics, in literature, in life, in, in finding new nuance to like engage with the world. All of this question is so boring mm. because we know the answers, we know the answers. And we know how people can live a more dignified life. So it's it's like offensive to have to engage in it. And it's boring. It's boring. It's interesting to hear you say that because I think what I know of your work has been like very comical and, and spicy. It's the opposite of boring. Um, but now we find ourselves in a time where we don't have live theatre in the same way. I mean, my work has always been truthful, I hope. I hope it's always been like truthful, um, but it's always been about kind of bigger questions, cancer, death, et cetera. Um, and the festival that I, that I run, that I co-curate The Sick of the Fringe, which just FYI was since 2015 was a festival about how social inequality affected health and well-being. <laughs> I know that people thought that they invented that field in 2020, but we've been working on that for a while. Many people have been. Um, but I think for me, it was always, I've never used humor to disarm. I've always used humor to be the appropriate mode of communication for me personally. I speak, I speak with a smile. That's what I do. You know, like that's, that's what the work is. And I think as I go on and on and on, the more people I work with, cause I do work with a lot of people uh, across cancer and professions, et cetera. It's about just find, helping people find the right tone for them. Some people are not in a space to laugh about the world that's around them. And in some ways, because I'm autobiographical, I can kind of laugh in my own direction. That's kind of okay. But I never wanna encourage people to, to enter a mode that they're not comfortable with. I'll just give a quick example of a project that I did two years ago in Japan in Kanazawa. I was working with a group of mostly elders with cancer, 
who were uh, absolutely amazing. And we made these, um, I just have them in the other room. Uh, they were called bendi, which is uh, the Japanese word for like a convenient tool. Like when you have like a cabbage slicer, something that just does one job. And it was a, a pack of 36 cards that people would read together. And it was about asking a cancer patient one-to-one -one with a stranger to talk about how they communicate, what are things that make them feel vulnerable, what are questions they'd wanna know from a cancer patient, et cetera. It was very basic. It was very, very basic. And, and it, they took between a half hour and three hours. That was the longest one was three hours, these conversations that I, that I helped make. But in that very basicness, there were 35 performers going all the time. So there were you know, 500 performances by the time we got over it. Some of them were very funny very loud and some of them were very quiet and very gentle and what I love about that project was I could kind of set the table and then people could have whatever meal they wanted to have it could be loud it could be raucous it could be quiet they could cry it could do what it is so I don't think that humor is a strategy like it's not a purposeful strategy it's that I'm trying to find the right voice for me and the voice that suits me most is usually light filled. Cause that's me. Cause that's, that's probably more to do with my mother than anything else, just cause she raised me to have this disposition. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, um, that feels like quite a nice place to end actually. Is there anything else that you'd like to, um, to raise or talk about or any kind of any um probes you'd like to have at the um the theme of our issue i mean i i the one thing i would love to just say about public health um i know that not all of your readership is in the uk but one thing that is really uh there's something coming down the pipeline in the uk that i'm like excited nervous really critical of, which is that now the Arts Council is doing a lot of work around social prescribing and they're wanting artists to be, and arts organizations do a lot of social prescribing work. And for people that don't know, social prescribing is that um, trying to find cultural or non-medical solutions to people's problems, particularly in relationship to loneliness, mental health, um, maybe physical health, um, you know, where they want to get people out walking, joining a walking club or doing something, crafts, et cetera. And the reason why I want to talk about this in relationship to, it, it is a current intervention that the UK government is really excited about. But the reason why is because it will always be cheaper to pay an artist to lead a workshop than a trained medical professional or a psychotherapist or a, you know, bereavement therapist, et cetera. And I'm very nervous that artists are just being asked to do the work that they don't want to fund <clears throat> by medical professionals. I believe in social prescribing. I believe in non-medical and specifically cultural and artistic interventions, but it's rollout from the UK government. It feels very fishy to me. It just feels like a cheaper way to get the same results. And I just would love for artists in the UK, and I think it's relevant to people outside of it. When people want an artist to have an intervention, are they actually just trying to save money? And if that's the case, how can we get ours money-wise? Because artists have never been paid for their work. And are you truly delivering what you need to do? Or do you need to be in more dialogue with health professionals? Because I think that there's merit, but there's, there's availability for abuse on such a thing also.